15, so let's begin. Welcome to the session on always, I'm saying always on, <laughs> in-memory OLTP engine. I'm really excited to be here, and I see some of the familiar faces here who have been to the previous sessions. I really appreciate you coming uh, for the third session. This session is a bit different. The previous sessions focused on the value proposition application migration, and this will focus on storage. How do you manage the storage? How do you do backup restores? What is the impact on the recovery time? And things like that. And all, also, always on. It so happens for CDP1, the always on integration is not there, but that is something we are working on. And it will be there in CDP2. So it's a must have requirement for us to support always on with in memory OLTP. As before, uh, this, I want this to be as interactive as possible. Ask me questions, and if it gets too detailed, I'll push it to the end, and then we can have the conversation. So high-level agenda is in-memory data structures. Some of the, these things we, we discovered or talked about in the previous session, but I will touch upon that a bit more. Then how is the memory managed? Because this is in-memory database. What happens, I mean, there were a lot of questions if I run out of memory, what happens? How do I monitor it? What do I do with it? How does it get garbage collected? Very important points. And then the third thing is, like I always hand wave, that it, even though it is in memory OLTP, but we guarantee full durability. That means if you shut down, if you crash, if your storage gets corrupted for whatever reason, just like SQL Server 12, you can restore the database to current point in time. So the full guarantee of durability, full asset. So you're not compromising on anything, but you are getting huge performance gains. So it's like a win-win situation. So one thing to walk away is that in in-memory OLTP, there are no pages. Zip. No pages, okay? That means no buffer pool. The memory that is managed for in-memory OLTP tables is very different than what it is for normal disk-based SQL tables, which is obviously the pages are read into buffer pool, and, and there's a caching policy, and so on. And the way we have done is the, the row is stored in memory. It is optimized for in-memory access. And also, we need to store the data row onto disk, right? If we do not store row onto the disk, that means it is not durable, right? So we have a optimized structure for disk. So we have a different structure for in-memory and different structure for storage. But from a user perspective, it doesn't really matter. Second thing which is important, uh, something we discussed yesterday, there is only one copy of data row. Now you wonder, we also have one copy of data row in disk space table, right? If I insert a row, there's only one row, right? But think about this, right? If you have indexes on that table, which I'm sure all of you have indexes, what happens is indexes have keys. So if you look at an index row, what it has is index key columns with the index row, and then there are pointers to the real data row, right? In many cases, to improve the performance, people even add covering columns in the index. So those are the copies of the column that you're creating in the index. You agree? So I'll make a very simple case. If I have a 16-column table, and let's say I have four indexes. I'm just making it up, four indexes and each index has four key columns, right? That means you have 16 columns in the data row for your disk-based table and 16 columns in the index row, right? They're almost making a copy of the data row, right? So there's only one copy, so that's the important point. We support, with the in-memory technology, we support two kinds of indexes. We support hash index. Hash index is only used for equality search. So suppose I say, give me a row that has employee ID 10, you can use hash index. You can also use 
B3 index, right? You can, B3 is very good for range indexes, but you can use B3 index. At this time in CTP1, we are only supporting hash index, but in CTP2, we will have range indexes as well. So you could search just like you do today. And finally, this is again a very non-intuitive point. In SQL Server, indexes are stored on the disk, right? In in-memory relational database system, we do not store indexes. The physical copy of the index is not on the disk. So what happens is when you load the data into memory, we create the index at the same time. So the common question people ask, creating an index is pretty expensive operation with disk-based tables. Agree? It's, it's very expensive operation. People don't do alter index rebuild when the workload is at peak. With in-memory OLTP, we are finding that creating the index while data is getting loaded is very efficient. So we don't have to store the index persistently on the disk. Okay. Now this is a really important thing because now if you look at the disk footprint of your table, you're only storing one copy of the data, not other copy. Right? So this is a huge point. Any questions on this? Okay, good. So a row for in-memory OLTP is not any different than the row you have for your regular disk-based table. It has a header and it has a payload, right? Header, columns, exactly like that. The difference is the header that you will see for in-memory OLTP is a bit different. And you will see there are four key columns. One is the begin timestamp, the end timestamp, and the statement ID, and there are index row pointers. And let me just walk through each of those. Right? What, what Hackathon is providing is a non-blocking access to the data. So there is no locks. Now, to provide a non-blocking access, you need to have row versions. Because without the row version, you cannot provide non-blocking protocol. Unless you are saying, I'm going to do read uncommitted, which means I'm going to give you dirty data. So we want to provide a transactionally consistent read without blocking. So just like we have snapshot isolation or RCSI, some of you might have used that feature, there has to be row version. So when there's a row version, there's a lifetime of a row version, right? I mean, I'll give you a very simple example just to motivate that. Let's say I is a transaction come and modify a row. When I modify a row, what I do, I make a copy of the row before I modify. This is how it happens in SQL 12, right? I make a copy. So I'm modified the row. I have an exclusive lock on that row for disk-based tables, right? Now you come in and you want to read the row. If you want to read the row that I'm modifying, you will get blocked, right? But in many cases, you don't care. You're saying, I'm gonna go read committed, I just want a transactionally consistent view. In that case, what SQL Server does, it points you to the previous version of the row, right? And then you see that row, right? So that's how it becomes non-blocking. Now what happens is, over time, when nobody, like say, I, over time when I commit my transaction, I committed the transaction and my update became a final update, right? There are no locks anymore on that row. The next person who comes in does not have to read the row version. Right? Because the transaction that changed the row already committed, so they will read the latest version. Right? So what do I do with the row that I had created a version of? We can get rid of that version. Right? You see that? I mean, the versions have to be removed. So what this begin timestamp and end timestamp are telling us, this is the range of time the row is valid or the row is visible to the transactions uh, that is being run in SQL Server. So if my SQL Server can guarantee there is no transaction that is active, it has a timestamp lower than end timestamp. That means there is no transaction that will be interested in this row. I can remove it, right? This is what we call garbage collection. Everybody on the same page with this, right? So this is why we have begin timestamp and end timestamp. Now there is a funny timestamp that we have. When you first insert a row, 
and you commit. Let's say my transaction was 200, so the begin timestamp is 200 because that's the transaction that created the row. Now the lifetime of the row at that point is infinity because we don't know if this will be ever deleted. So the begin timestamp is 200 in this example, and the end timestamp will be infinity, right? Until a transaction comes from later, say, 1,000 times, uh, uh, timestamp, then it will say end timestamp becomes 1,000. You see what I'm saying? So that's how we manage. So the key point for us is make sure that we are aggressively garbage collecting these versions. Otherwise, what happens is these rows that are sitting there consuming memory, and you don't want to have them piling up so that you're running out of memory resource, right? Very important point for us. <clears throat> yeah. So the table, is that the same as the normal time disk with the fixed variable length, offset, relative maps, all of those things? Right. So the question is, how do we store those columns in that payload? We can do offline onto this exact format, but yeah, it is essentially the list of columns, and there's a way to fetch a column from that row, whether they do null bitmap or not, but yeah, there is a way. Other thing that is there is the row size is limited to 8,060. Now, this is a tricky point. A lot of people get mix, uh, mixed up with that. Even SQL Server disk-based table have row size of 8,060. It does not go beyond that. However, disk-based tables provide some hooks to increase the size. And the example is, if I have a bar chart column, which is 256, and let's say I start that row with only I insert two rows, two columns, sorry. The length of that 256 byte column is, let's say, two bytes. Then I come and update and make it 256 bytes. Now that row does not fit on that page, right? So what we do is uh, we store some of those things off row onto a different page. So there are ways to have a row which uh, has an outside size. But the key point is with, with in-memory technology, we do not allow off row storage. So this is 8,060 right now. Okay, now the question is, is it a problem for me? In most OLTP workloads, we are focusing on OLTP. Typical row sizes that I've seen is 200 bytes, somewhere in that range. And uh, I'm not sure if you have rows which is greater than 8,060 in your environment. Anybody has 8,060 and above for OLTP workload? Okay, a couple of them. So if you have that big a row, there are ways to manage it. You can break the table into two, right? You can vertically partition it, have a primary key column to join them, things like that. But in many cases, it will, uh, 8,060 limit is, uh, works very well for OLTP workloads. The other thing that uh, we talked about yesterday was we do not support every column type that we have for, for disk-based tables. We do not support XML, we do not support blobs, we do not support spatial, because those data types are not as commonly used in a OLTP environment. And if you have to use it, right? I mean, I can say I have an employee table and I have an employee picture, right? Which is my OLTP database. But the picture is not something that you reference every day. You can break that into, you see what I'm saying? There are ways to manage that. So it is true, I mean, ideally speaking, if Hackathon or in-memory OLTP supported an application with zero changes, I mean, it is great. It, if it, I mean, if it could do that. But the thing is, there are a few minor tweaks you have to do in some cases, but the upside is huge, right? Because you just do those tweaks and you're, suddenly the performance gains could be phenomenal. Now this example I talked about a few times before. Let me just walk through a visual on this one. The reason I prepared this visual was based on the questions I got for, for the last two, three days. So this is how a non-cluster index is organized in disk-based tables, right? This looks very familiar. So now if I was searching for a row through this index, I go to the root page, right? And the root page, I latch. I pick the row, which points me to the next page, right? It goes to the disk page. Then it goes to the leaf node, right? Once I go to the leaf node, if my query can be satisfied by the leaf node, I'm set, right? Otherwise, I have to traverse down the cluster index, right? So the point is, this is how it is structured, and I was actually talked about this point a few times, that 
even though your disk-based tables may be in memory, but they are not optimized for memory, right? There's a difference. Something being in memory, which is good, you will get better performance. Don't get me wrong. Having everything in memory helps you, right? But it is not optimized for memory, right? Because of the page structures. Now, the same example, here is a hash index. Hash index essentially is very simple structure. You have a key on which you are hashing. There's a hash table. You have a key. You hash, apply it. It gives you a hash ID or the bucket ID. You go to that bucket ID and just insert the row there, right? Now, the, if the same example has to be there, our hash table is in memory for, for a hackathon. I hash it. It comes to bucket two in this example and just goes to the row, right? So imagine this, right? I was traversing through this index tree, finding the row versus this. So you can see visually why in-memory index of hash index can give you a very, very fast access to your data for equality search. And we are doing very similar thing for range index. And at this time, I'm not at the liberty to talk about that. But you see that benefit, right? Questions? Okay. So now the thing is, in memory comes with some uh, gotchas, if, if you want to use that word, gotchas. The point is, we cannot assume that data is not in physical memory. For Hecaton, data has to be in physical memory, right? I mean, of course, we can write code to account for the data is not in memory, things like that. But what we have optimized for is, you as a IT person, you as a DBA, have to guarantee that you have data or you have memory to store all your data, right? So the data has to be in physical memory all the time. Now, this is a challenge sometimes because sometimes people will say, you know, I have a table, it's growing, right now it fits in memory, five years down the road, who knows? You see what I'm saying? And then what do I do? The thing is, uh, it's a great question. The point is, Number one, you do not have to store full database into Hecaton, right? Only the performance critical parts of your table have to be in Hecaton. So you can manage that way. And then, as you will see, we support up to 512 gigabyte size of your table. I mean, that's a huge table, and it will be fine for majority of customers, right? And if your table is beyond that, I can bet if you have a table of that size, you have partitioning on because you really cannot manage a table of that size uh, without pains unless you have partition. That means you have partition means that you have partition that is very active and the partition that are not very active, right? So what I'm saying is you need to put the active part in Hackathon. Granted, at this time, Hackathon does not support partitioning. So you cannot have a table in Hackathon which is partitioned. So there's some limitations. So that is something to be aware of, right? If you have a situation where your table is not partitioned and it is beyond 512 gigabyte, uh, then you will not be able to take advantage of Hackathon at this time, okay? So you have to configure your uh, SQL Server with the right amount of physical memory. Now what happens is if you are running out of physical memory, it's not the database will die, it is just gonna reject your new transactions, right? It's just like your log space running out. Database does not, I mean, yes, there will be no logging. That means you can only do select, nothing else, right? So that would be the situation. Now, Hackathon, as I said, Hackathon engine, this is actually the most important point for us. It is part of SQL Server. This is not a new binary. This is sitting inside SQL Server. Everything is managed same way. So SQL Server process is giving out memory to Hackathon Engine. So Hackathon Engine from SQL Server process is another consumer of memory, right? So all the DMVs that you look at, like the clerks and everything else, you can see what's going on inside SQL Server, how much memory has been given to Hackathon and so on. So you can monitor perfectly. So now what happens is if we give you the right capability to monitor how memory is being used, you can react to the problem that can show up in future. For example, if you're seeing my hackathon tables are growing faster and I'm running out of physical memory, you can add more physical memory, right? You can increase max server memory of your SQL server. So those are the things you will be able to do. 
Now, one question people ask is, you know, I have a SQL server that is being used in a consolidation environment where I have multiple applications running on the same box. I do not want Hackathon to take so much physical memory that everything else is compromised, right? So that can happen. So what we are providing in CTP1, this is actually based on the customer feedback. We will use resource governor and you will have the capability to say that this database has in-memory tables and I only want to limit the size of that database for memory to this much. So then we will, you have a guarantee that Hackathon table for that database will not exceed that physical limit. Now it is possible that if it is indeed reaching that limit, you want to add more memory, you can add more memory, you can change the pool setting, you can do all those things. But the key point is, it is sandboxing the memory consumption of your uh, in-memory data. Sounds good? Okay. Right, so, so think of this, right? The max serve memory is a big circle. You are having small, small circles inside that, and you can say this circle belongs to this database. So it cannot take more memory than that. That's correct. That's correct. So the last thing you want is um, see, the difference with the Hecaton memory is once it consumes it, it does not release it. For example, if I insert rows, I can't just throw rows away, right? Because those are your rows, right? Unlike buffer pool, things like that, where I can shrink it, right? So, so once the memory is given to Hecaton, right, it does not release it unless it was the rows that were garbage collected, right? So, so what we also do is, if you do not have resource pool, by default there's a default resource pool, Hecaton will not take 80% of your complete physical memory. It will not Leave, it will leave last 20% to make sure your SQL server is up and running. Okay, in some cases it could have taken the whole 100% and then you're dead. Uh, question. So is that also with the resource That's right, so great. That's right. Even with the resource governor, it will just take up to 80%. Okay, so that's the, the, the thing we have done. So, so the question now is, uh, I have a table, disk space table, Right, I'm migrating, how much physical memory do I need? So our general guideline is, because you'll be deleting rows, you'll be manipulating rows, there'll be row versions. So what we are saying is, rule of thumb is, if you have your table size of 20 gigabyte, let's assume that, just make sure you have around 40 gigabyte lying around for that, to manage the versions for a mostly trouble-free operation. Okay, so this is just a guideline. Uh, other, other thing to, uh, so this is for the data. For the index that we have for hash index, the each hash uh, entry that we have is uh, eight bytes. Uh, I think it is eight bytes, right? So if I have a hash table with one million buckets, so that will be eight megabytes. So you have to account for hash indexes and you have to account for the data. So this is pretty much all the memory that you need. Now this is maybe at this time of your table, but the table is maybe growing. So if you know that over one year your table will grow from 20 gigabyte to 30 gigabyte or 50 gigabyte, right? You know what to do, right? You have to uh, arrange uh, or assign resources which can account for that growth, okay? Now it sounds scary, I mean, don't get me wrong, it sounds scary, but the thing is, in many cases that we work with customers, most tables were like under 15 gigabyte, 20 gigabyte, right? And uh, even they are growing, so it can be easily managed because you have boxes available today. I mean, one example that I had was a 16 core box with 256 gigabyte of physical memory with SSDs was under $13,000, $14,000. I mean, this is a huge box, right? So it's not a, it's not a, uh, uh, out of, uh, it's not imaginary to say, you know, you cannot have 256 gigabyte of physical memory. So there is yeah, memory available. So as I said, for configuration, we are using a resource manager, and for monitoring, we are providing the DMVs and all the familiar tools that you have. And this is the benefit that you have with the integration, that everything that you uh, know, you can leverage that knowledge that you have to manage Hackathon. So, so this is actually a simple uh, animation that shows if you are inserting more rows than can fit in memory, transactions start failing, now, other thing which is interesting is, right, when you want to 
restore a database that has in memory tables, right? I restore a database. So the question is when I look at that restore database, I don't know how much memory do I need to restore the database because there may be 10 hackathon tables inside that backup in the log backup, right? So, so the thing is, at this time, we do not provide a tool to tell you how much physical memory you will need to restore this backup. But a guideline is if your backup was, um, let's say, 100 gigabyte. I'm just making it up, right? In the worst case, you need 100 gigabyte because you assume everything was needed for your hackathon. But I think our recommendation there is to make sure when you back up the database, you have some idea what the size of in-memory uh, tables were, right? So that much, when you restore from one box to next box, you need to make sure the second box has enough memory to host that uh, hackathon. Now, if you don't have, the recovery will fail. It will tell you why it failed, and then you can reprovision your box and restore that, right? So that's important. So Hackathon engine, as I said, it, it loves memory, right? I mean, once it gets it, it doesn't leave it because we, you don't want to lose your rows, right? So it is, your, it is guarding your rows, right? Except if it is under pressure, memory pressure, what happens is if there are garbage rows, Hackathon will be more aggressive in garbage collection and return the garbage collected rows, but not the rows that you have. That's your application data, right? Unless you say this rows are not needed, you can delete the rows, or what you can do is you can say, I'm gonna migrate half of my rows which are not performance critical to SQL, right? We can always do this, right? You can move rows from in-memory table to SQL table, right? The, the disk-based table. You can manage that. But I'm not saying those are trivial operations, it depends really on your application. But, uh, but a Hackathon will uh, react under pressure, but it will only release the rows that are garbage collected. So you can read the error log, you can do the DMVs and all those things, good stuff is there. You can free up memory, add more physical memory, things like that. Those are the things you can do. Now, the garbage collection. This is actually a very critical point. How do you do garbage collection? You already know why row gets garbage, right? Because they have a lifetime, and once the lifetime expires, we can garbage collect them. So the garbage collection is a challenge when you, you know, if you have worked with any language like Java and things like that, when the garbage collection happens, the system comes to a standstill because rows are getting garbage collected. And we were very sensitive to that. We said we need to make garbage collection not slow down the system, okay? So what we have done is, our garbage collection is uh, done, let me go to the next point. Our design goal was the garbage collection has to be cooperative. So there is no separate thread that does the garbage collection in a periodic way. So what happens is, each transaction when it is running, it does some part. It says, okay, I'm running, I'm committing my transaction, before it commits, it says, is there any garbage for me to collect? So it does some garbage collection. So basically all the active transactions that are running, they do some job of garbage collection. So it's a very cooperative way. You see what I'm saying? So if you have a very active system, a lot of transactions are running, still each of those transactions will do garbage collection. So that way it happens in a very uh, natural way. There is also a dedicated thread for garbage collection. So essentially think of garbage collection in Hackathon is, is cooperative, and there's a garbage collection thread that does garbage collection as well. So you will never have a situation where garbage is growing beyond control because your thread was slowing down. Because if you have more garbage, that means you have more transaction, those transactions will pick up the garbage. That's how it is. A question? Is there a limit to how much each transaction That's right. So question really is, uh, is there a limit on how much each garbage? The system has a internal algorithm to figure out how much garbage is there and how to dole it out. So, so it's each transaction, so it does not impact the latency as much. I think that is the concern that if my transaction is a very critical transaction, and if it is wasting time collecting garbage, I'm dead, right? So it, it controls that. So this is how it is done, right? For example, I'm running a select statement, and these blue rows that you're seeing are the rows that are there in the system, and assume the oldest active transaction has a timestamp of 175. Just for, for this, assume that, right? Now this transaction four, it begins at time 210, okay? 
Now it is going through these rows and it says oldest active transaction is 175. So can it mark this row as a garbage? It cannot because the oldest active transaction is 175. So that means there is a chance that some transaction may need this row, right? This, another version is infinity, this cannot remove that. But this one, 100, right? This, it knows nobody will need it, right? So it can be garbage collected. So when it is scanning the data, even at that time, it, uh, it will remove that row. You see what I'm saying? It's happening as a part of the scan. It just says this is a garbage row, it can be done. Right, so this is one example how the cooperative garbage collection is going on. The questions on this? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a very simple demo of uh, memory management and uh, how garbage collection is done. So I go here. So what I have is, um, is a, I'm gonna create a database here. Oh, I have not switched yet. Sorry. Okay. The font is okay to the person in the back? Okay, so I'm gonna create this database. And notice something that I've shown before, that here I'm just saying this database has a memory optimized file group. That means I can, you need the memory optimized file group to create in memory OLTP databases, okay, tables. So I'm gonna create this database Oh, it already exists, I'm gonna drop it. Okay, right? Very familiar set of command. And now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna create a table. It's a two column table, okay? And I'm saying durability here, it is schema and data. That means it is durable, okay? I, I do this. The table got created and let us see what I see in the management studio. I refresh here, all right? I go here and I look at the report, standard report, and notice here, it has a drop down thing saying memory used by memory optimized objects. So let's look at that. So what it is showing in the red part of the circle is the memory taken by the index, okay? Currently it is showing that this table is taking eight megabyte, and you know where this is coming from? because I just created the table. It is coming because I have a index on this table. I go back here with a bucket count of one million, right? So I have one million bucket count. Each bucket takes eight bytes, so I got eight megabytes, right? So this is how it is. So this tool that I'm showing you, the report, this will come with Management Studio. You can manage that. You can look at the report, right? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert some rows into this table. I go here and I begin transaction and I insert rows, right? So I inserted some rows. So now when I go back to my report, I should see not only the index rows, I should also see the rows taken by, the space taken by this table, right? Here, what you see in the green, it shows the table use memory, and here it says the memory that is unused. Because what happens is we're not really allocating space for one row at a time. We're allocating some chunks and we're doling out, right? So that's how we do it. Okay, so this is how it is done. And these reports that I'm showing here, they are using the DMVs and things underneath. So all those things you could do even through DMVs, right? So this is just a very visual tool to show how memory is being consumed. So I go here again, and then I'm gonna add another table. And here I'm gonna do I'm gonna insert 100,000 100, rows. So I go here, so it's gonna insert 100,000 rows. So see, it is done. So this is a durable table. Imagine how quickly it gets done, right? And now if I want to look at the rows, I can do this DMV. So it is showing me that this table, I have two tables, T1 and T2. Memory allocated for this table is here. Use is so-and-so, index is so-and-so, right? And notice I have 8192 in both cases because the bucket size was that, right? And if I go to my uh, report, I can uh, refresh it. And now I got 16 gigabyte for my, 16 megabyte for my indexes, 
and you see that, right? So this is how you're monitoring. You can monitor through this, you can monitor through the DMVs, okay? Now what I'm gonna show you is, I want to delete some rows. And I want to show that my memory is getting deallocated, right, the garbage collected, okay? So here, what I'm gonna do is, on my first table, just remember, 1562, that was the memory taken by table one, right? Okay, let me just delete every alternate row. So now I deleted the rows, right? That means half the rows are gone. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do a simple select from this table. So if you notice, it's gonna find only 5,000 rows, right? Because I deleted the rest of the rows, right? And if I look at my memory taken by this table, this, and if I go back here, you see that it is coming down. It is garbage collecting, right? It was, and you see why it is happening, because the scanner is going through, it's saying there is no active transaction that needs a row version, is getting garbage collected as part of the select. So the key point to remember is, there is a background garbage collection thread, but it is not the only guy which is doing the garbage collection, right? And this is a very important thing because we want to make sure that system is able to keep up with the garbage. A question you have. Great question. So question really is, if I declare a hash table of one million buckets, number of buckets will not change. You know, like, I think bucket, uh, let me see that I'm using the right term. So hash table has pointers to the buckets, right? So eight byte pointer to the bucket. Let's use that term. So I have a hash table of one million pointers. So I have one million, uh, one million means eight megabyte. Now, when I point to a row, so there's a row there, right? Now what happens is if I insert another row that maps to the same hash bucket, so there will be a pointer from the data row to the next row. The pointers are embedded inside the data row. So it is, so if you look at each data row, I can go back to that uh, row diagram. Each row has eight pointers, up to eight pointers. So it will point to the next row. No, so the thing is, uh, let me go back to the picture, and I think that will help. So I go back here. That's right, the, the, the hash table will not grow. So here, what is happening is that this is eight bytes, right? It is pointing to the row, and this row R1 is pointing to row R2 there is a pointer sitting inside there. And each row can have up to eight pointers. Okay? So you can only have eight million rows in that table. No, no, no. So the thing is, the reason you're, okay, so, so let's just uh, tease that apart, right? The point is, you all agree that we have a, one million entries in my hash table, right? Okay. Now, in an ideal situation, there is no collision, and you have perfect hash table. If you have one million rows, each of the rows will go to its own bucket, right? That's the ideal situation. But that doesn't happen that way, right? There will be some collision. So if two rows get mapped to the same bucket, those entries need to be linked, right? Now, let's say I'm using the pointer one, because there are eight pointers in each data row. I'm using pointer one for index one. Now, if I happens that I'm hashing 10 rows to the same bucket, the pointer one of row one points to the row two, pointer one of row two points to row three, pointer one of row three points, right? So same pointer. So there is no eight million thing. So it's, yeah, it's just for collisions, right? And that chain, I mean, you can create, a, I mean, once you get the CTP one, you can create a hash table of size, say, 1K, and insert one billion rows. And what you will see is your 
collision is huge and each chain may have you know divide by whatever right that many rows you see how much collision that's right you can yeah this is exposed yeah yeah i think i let me do this i think question really is is there a dmv to show how much collision we are seeing i think there is i have not looked into in a while but send me mail on this one yeah question Uh, what is no so that's right so so the question this is a very common question customers have what is the right bucket size right ideally people wanted cannot sql server create buck, i mean hash table that grow automatically i mean why do i have to deal with this right and we looked at the performance things right because by having a bucket size fixed we can give you much better performance right so so the thing is if you know you have 10 million rows let's let's say that right so our recommendation would be create a hash table with a 16 million uh, buckets that way you have uh, taken care of the future growth and you're able to have a good hash i mean distribute the rows across the hash table right but if so happens that in your system you get to 32 million rows because you did not account for it we have done analysis the performance impact up to three collisions is not huge so so there are ways to handle that second thing that we are doing is the range index that we're going to provide in cdp2 that could be used both for equality search as well as range search there there's no limitation on the bucket size so you can there's no bucket to be specified so that may be another way to go through that okay that's right that's right right so the question uh, right so the suggestion basically is if i knew how much collision is there that can be a telltale sign for me to say that i have to do some data management activity yeah we can yeah right so i so the question really is can't seco server team do this everything automatically why do i have to have one more task on my head to manage this things yeah I agree I agree so in the worst case what you could do is you can have a x event which triggers when this thing happens and you can have a script to say you know what when that thing happens I'll take care of so this has to be it can be automated so it's not as big a deal but but it's a concern yeah okay. sorry so uh, the question is can the hash table be resized because that would be the easy thing to do with with sql 14 we are not supporting alter index command now that for some of you may seem very very basic i mean alter index not supported but trust me uh, we are working through the features that we need to support and what we need to do uh, so for this reason we decided we will not support alter table or alter index in sql 14 so it's not available so you have to do as an offline operation you have to yeah So let me go back to my slide. Let's see what how we are doing with the time. Okay, we have half an hour left, so that's good. Let me just move forward. So we got done through the demo. Uh, garbage collection is done. Okay, the durability. Now, uh, as I said, the the in-memory tables or OLTP are durable, and we also provide an option to say that this table is not durable. and this is a amazing option because if you are doing etl kind of workload or places where you use temp tables you can use in memory table because you don't care about the data i mean if the data gets lost it gets lost it's a temporary table right so what it provides is it provides a durable schema but non durable data so think about this right in a temp db when you shut down restart all your temp tables are gone right you have to recreate them there is no schema durability with with hackathon the non durable table guarantees schema durability right so advantages for example if you have etl scenario where you have a table which is a landing table you restart your sql server the landing table is still there so your backup the, the etl scripts continue to work there is no step needed to say let me create my landing table because i just started my sql server so so this is uh, a schema is durable now the storage like i said in memory tables are not page based so we have have a special storage 
to store the in-memory tables, right? And one of the goals we had was, like if you think of uh, storage for disk-based tables, the storage pattern is very random, right? When the buffer pool reads the page, you make the page dirty, write something, and when the checkpoint happens, the pages go to different places in the file, right? So this is all random access, and that's one of the reasons why checkpoints sometimes take so long, because it is randomizing the disk. So one of the things to get high transactional throughput, we said, let's remove randomization completely. So the only access that we do to these files that we store in this file group is sequential. There's never a random I.O. there. And that gives us a huge I.O. bandwidth to deal with. And, and you will see why it, it is so. Uh, other thing is, uh, uh, remember, like once you start SQL Server with in-memory tables, we have to load the data from those files into memory, right? If it was reading one file at a time, it will be slow, right? So what we have done is uh, we, you can distribute the data across multiple files. When you restart, it will read from all the files depending on number of cores you have. Suppose you have 16 core machine, it can read 16 at a time and load the data. So, it is that, that, uh, so that's why you have a lot of options to spread it out. This we just talked about. This is how you specify a file group. We just say it's memory optimized file group. Now, the Hecadon storage underlying mechanism is a file stream. Okay, the file stream functionality that is available, we use exactly the same uh, storage, but we don't mix that with any table with a file stream column. So when I have memory optimized file group, it is dedicated for Hecaton. It is not used by another table that has file stream column. For that, you need to create a file stream file group. Okay, so from you, your perspective, you have primary file group, you have log, you have memory optimized file group, and if you have file stream tables, you may have file stream file groups, but they are not together, okay? We just use the same uh, functionality. Second thing that we have done, we have a checksum on the files that we have with memory optimized file group, so we can correct at least one bit failure. So the storage, uh, this actually I'm gonna spend some time on it. The storage for Hecaton storage is, uh, consists of two kinds of files, data file and delta file, data and delta. So, so when you look at that memory optimized file group, you will see two files. So what data file stores, it only stores the rows that you insert, okay? Now, I have a data file and I have say two tables in Hecaton, T1 and T2. I insert one row in T1, that row will get persisted in the data file. I insert row one in table two, that goes to the same file. So if you look at rows in the data file, you may have consecutive rows coming from different tables. Okay, so this is all added sequentially. Unlike SQL Server, where a page contains rows only from the same table, right? So think of this, uh, the data file, as rows are coming in to any table in Hecaton, they're getting appended there. Okay, so all inserts that are you're seeing is all appended. Okay, we'll come to that. The question really is how fast does it go, right? Because the point is, if it is slow, uh, then, I mean, I cannot truncate my log, but stay with this point. So the key point is data is getting inserted. Now what happens is, if I have to delete a row that I just inserted, what do I do? There are two options, right? I could go back to my data file, and say remove this row. Agree? This is what SQL does, right? It removes that row from the page. But what we did was, because that will be random I.O., so we said, you know what, we should have another file which we call delta file. So what we will do when a row is deleted, instead of going back to the data file to say this row is deleted, we just mark in the delta file that this row is deleted. So even the delete is appending to the delta file. So insert and delete. An update is done, delete, followed by an insert. So that's how we do it. So, so now you see why it is uh, sequential in both cases. So here what I'm showing you is a data file and a delta file. It is at a very high level. What you're seeing on the green side is you have the transaction that inserted the row, which table it belonged to, because as I said, the data file has rows from all the tables. It has to know which table it belonged to. 
and and the some row ID and the row payload, which is the columns, right? So these are all getting appended. And similarly, you have delta file, which is telling which rows are getting deleted. Now, here is the challenge. If I have 100 gigabyte worth of data, I cannot just have one data file. I have to spread it out, right? So what we do is we have data files which are size 128 megabyte each, right? So 128 megabyte data file, the next one as they get filled up. So this is how we chunk it. So now what happens is, let's say I inserted a row yesterday. It went to data file one. Three days later, I want to delete that row. And at that time, I'm on file 1000 because that was like three days ago. So the question is, where should I put the delta row? Because the row that I deleted belonged to the first data file, right? So what we need to find out is which delta file I need to append that row to, right? So what we do is we have a way, we have this timestamp that you see 0 to 100. So when you have a data file and delta file, we have a transaction range. This is 0 to 100 for this data file, and there's a delta file, right? So in future, when I go and delete a row which had a timestamp of 50, right, the timestamp of 50, and I'm going to delete that row, then I need to figure out which delta file. In this case, it will come to this delta file. So the key point is that each data delta file is a pair, and they have a transaction range to it. So when I'm deleting a row, I know which range I need to go to. Because remember, we had a begin timestamp and end timestamp. So I know by, when I go to delete the row, I know where to go. Uh, there are two questions. Uh, yes, sir. So, so let me, uh, okay, so the question really is, if I did a transaction that was bad for my database, how do I figure out when that transaction happened, then I can restore up to that point in time. So all those things that are available, we are not changing that, because the transaction log for Hecaton tables and SQL table is integrated together, so everything should just work as before, okay. We can do offline discussion on that one. Uh, question on, Hold that thought. The question is, is data file reusable? Hold that thought. I think I'll come to it. So, so the question that was asked here is, how do these files get loaded? How do, uh, is it like what the speed is? So I have a more complicated visual, and um, hopefully it will illustrate the point. So remember, the green file is the data file, and the red file is the delta file, right? If I go back to my previous picture. Yeah? OK. So at a given time, your memory optimized file group has a bunch of data and delta files, right? And they are sitting here as a pair. So what it is showing here is this data file has all the transactions that inserted the rows from 100 to 199. I've simplified it because it is not evenly distributed, right? Uh, 200 to 299 and so on, right? This is what it is. And what these red files are saying is these are the rows that were deleted from this set. So the higher the red bar is, more rows that got deleted, right? So that means there are a lot of holes in some of these data files. So what we need to do, uh, so the question is, uh, so this is what's going on. And now my transaction is going on, right? So this is where my SQL transaction log is. So there is a thread. This is unique to in-memory OLTP. We call offline checkpoint thread. So what it is doing is, as a log record comes, like here, a log record came with a timestamp of 150. It said I deleted a row with a timestamp 150. So what it did was, it added, appended that row to this data, delta file. You see that? There's an offline guy just reading the transaction log record as it is happening. It see a del delete log record. It says, what was the timestamp for the row? 150, let me go here. The next one that it sees is 450, it adds here. Then it sees 250, it adds here. So you see what I'm saying? This offline guy, as your transaction is going on, 
it is scanning the log records and updating the data files and the delta files. So that's happening uh, uh, while the transaction activity is on. And if there's a new insert, it goes to the data file. You see that this is how it is getting populated. So this is actually interesting because now the persistence of the data is happening as transactions are being generated. There is no stop everything, do my checkpoint. Let me copy the data to the desk. So it's happening as uh, it's going on, right? Sorry? That's right. So for now, the question really is, as rows are being put, there is no uh, reuse means once I delete a bunch of rows, what do I do, right? Is that the question you have? That's right. The tensor, the space of tensor took in your data file, can that be used by another Right, right. So the question really is, as data files have rows, rows get deleted, how do I reclaim the space? And let's go, let's go to the next slide, yeah? So you see that how the data is being loaded into this data and the delta files. So the, the real question is, uh, so I'm gonna skip this part. So, the merge, this is where we, what we do is, as like data and the data files are getting generated, rows are getting deleted, at some point I need to find some, row, uh, some files that I can merge to reclaim the space. And that's what the merge operation is all about. So what merge can do, it can merge two adjacent pair, uh, pairs of data and the data file. And what it does is, it says it has some policy. Policy says, if I merge two files, will the resultant file be less than 128 megabyte, right? So for example, if I, in a simplistic example, if I have two data files, and let's say half the rows have been deleted from each of those files. So when I merge them, I can get one file and get rid of those two files. So this is exactly what merge is doing. So what it means is that as your DMLs are going on, the files are being reclaimed in the background, and those files are being available for the next future data in the data files. And this is an online operation. This is something you don't have to worry about. It is happening for you in the background, in the policy. And in some cases, like if it is not doing the way you want it, we will provide a manual merge. So you have a DMV which tells you what the space usage is in each of those files. You can say, I want to merge these files. So you can do that. So, uh, question? That's right. Great point. So the question is, like these merges that we do, we have to maintain the transaction range. So you cannot merge a pair from transaction range 100 to 200 and a pair from 5,000 to 5,100. You cannot merge that. You have to be consecutive. We can merge up to 10 data delta files together which are consecutive. And in some cases, when I merge, the resultant file size could be more than 128 megabytes. So we are not really bound to that, but that's the goal that we have. So this is, okay, the merge thing that we do, it is not part of offline checkpoint thread, it is done a separate thread. It's a merge thread that is running. Let me uh, go forward a little bit and come to the question. So it's an online operation, and this is a visual of, of the merge operation, right? So here, what you see on the left side, this is how it looked at time 500. So notice here, you have these two delta files that are big, and let's say it chooses them to merge, right? So what happens is, at time 600, it marks these are the things I'm gonna merge, okay? So while it is being merged, it is available. So it's not that you cannot really delete rows from this transaction range, everything is online. And it merges, and it creates the new data file and delta file. And notice, in this case, the merge range from 200 to 299, 300 to 399 was combined, right? And it became from 200 to 399. It got combined, and then, these files get garbage collected. So this is how you're managing the store. And this is pretty aggressive in the sense, so end of the day, what you should see, in the worst case, your data files are half full. I mean, this is pretty much the worst case, right? Because they are not qualifying for the merge. And if you want to reclaim the space on top of that, you can manually merge them. Nobody's gonna stop you. Now, the transaction logging is a little different. I mean, number one, we have to do transaction logging, right? Without that, when the transaction commits and say, transaction committed, we have to make sure the logs are persistent, right? 
So the Hackathon log is integrated with SQL Server and uh, Hackathon log record is a little different and I'm going to show you an example how it looks like. Now remember when SQL log is written there are like LSNs and the page timestamps and things like that. In this case it is logical and there is no physical modification, it's just logical information and there is no undo information. The reason there is no undo information is because we only write the log records when the transaction commits. There is nothing to undo, right? So we optimize on that. Second thing that we do is we do not write transaction log records for indexes because indexes are not persisted. Okay. Now, uh, let me do this example of 100 bytes. Um, okay, so here is what I'm showing is if you are inserting a into a hackathon table, 10 rows, begin transaction, insert 10 rows, okay? And if you look at the transaction log record, this is how it shows. Begin transaction log record, and there is a special log record which we call HK log record. And notice the length of this record is 1276. So what it is doing is, it is combining all those 10 rows into one log record. Unlike SQL Server, where it would have logged 10 log records, right? So what it means is, we are not really going to the log thing, write a log record, write a log record. We are combining it. That gives you some more efficiency. And if you want to look at inside what this 1, 2, 7, 6 byte log record looks like, it provides, and I have a demo on this one, it, you can even tease it apart, and then you see that there are 10 rows that are part of this log record. But the key point from your perspective is, Hecaton logging is done a little differently, but it is done, and, and it minimizes the number of log records that you need to write. Okay, now on, on that let me uh, go to the demo first. Uh, I think it will be interesting. So I go here. So what I want to show you is the logging part. And I first let me delete the database. Uh, go here, delete. Okay, the database is deleted. I connect. Okay, the database has been dropped. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the database and use the database. And then I have a table, same table that I had before. I'm going to create the table. and I'm going to create also a disk based table. So what I'm creating here is a hackathon table, T1, and I'm also creating a disk based table, same schema, okay? And since I have a primary key index for my hackathon table, I'm going to create a uh, index here. So now I have a SQL table and a hackathon table. So now let me just do this. I'm going to insert 100 rows into a disk based table, T1 underscore disk. Let me insert 100 rows, okay? got inserted. Now, I need to see what we got logged for that, right? So I have a uh, partition ID is so and so, so let me figure out what got logged. This is actually very interesting. So I go here, I copy the partition ID, copy this, paste, copy this and I paste it here. Okay. So now, if I want to see, I inserted just 100 rows and let's see what got logged. So what you will see is it has logged 200 rows. And why it is so? Because there's an index and there's a row. So it is logging one row for each row that you inserted and one row for each index, right? So it got 200 log records with SQL, right? Not a surprise. Now, if I want to do the same thing for my memory optimized table, I go here, I insert 100 rows into my memory optimized table. Commit. And if I want to look at the log record, I go to the bottom, and you will see it just logged one log record. And notice the size is 11,964 byte. So, so this is how we are optimizing the logging that we need to do. So it's combining everything into single log record. Make sense? Okay.
So the question now is how much storage do I need to allocate? One of the things we need to do is you need to make sure, I mean, at the worst case, your data file are half full. So you need to make sure that you have twice the space. And again, we are using sequential uh, I.O., so, so you don't have to worry about that part. And logging, as I said, is much more efficient with disk-based table compared to, it is, sorry, for in-memory table than it is for disk-based tables. If the latency is important for you, then you need to go for a higher uh, throughput uh, device. In this case, you rec we recommend, I mean, because transaction throughput will be so high, we recommend you to use SSDs. I'm going to skip this slide because I have only 10 minutes left. I want to talk about the backups. So the backup that we have for in-memory tables, because in-memory tables are part of SQL database, right? So your SQL database, when I do my backup, the hackathon tables will get backed up as part of SQL database uh, backup. Backup compression just works. Everything is uh, like whatever works for SQL Server today continues to work with the database with in-memory tables. Piecemeal restore works. Existing backup scripts will work without any changes. So the key takeaway is whatever operations that you do for a database management, they continue to work as before. It is integrated with third-party tools. What we don't support with in-memory tables is we do not support differential backup. So if you have a differential backup as a policy and you have in-memory tables, you cannot use differential backup. We are also, at this time, do not do checksum validation of hackathon storage, the memory optimized storage, but this is under consideration for CDP2. So that's what we're going to do. The log backup, just like database backup, it is backed up as part of your log backup. Right. So, so let me come to that point. Question really is what happens to DBCC check DB? At this time, DBCC check DB does not check Hackathon database, but that is something that we are working in CDP2. It will validate the checksum of your data files, very optimized files. Okay. So we support all recovery models. We support uh, simple, bulk logged, full recovery. Everything is supported. But for Hackathon, everything is fully logged. So for example, if you have a database, where you have simple recovery model, hackathon objects are still fully logged. So that's the only difference, but otherwise all your recovery models are supported. Uh, it will still be simple logging for, for disk-based tables. So in the recovery phase, this is actually important. So when I do want to do the recovery, now unlike SQL disk-based tables, I have to bring the data into physical memory, right? So what I should do is I'm going to go to the next slide for the recovery, and I will uh, show you the visual how recovery is done. So the key point is when I want to recover my database, I have the data sitting in the data files and the delta files. I need to load that data. So what I'm showing here in the green are the two containers, and then I have data data file pairs that are sitting around. So when the recovery happens, what SQL Server does it loads the delta files and creates a delta filter. So it says, this delta file has 20 rows deleted, this delta file has five rows deleted, so that it has created the delta filters, okay? And now, once it has created those filters, then it loads each of the data files in parallel. So what happens is it reading the data file, it says row one, is it in delta filter? No, that means this row is not yet deleted, it loads into memory, row two, it is in delta filter, I can skip it, row three, and so on. So this is how it is loading everything in parallel in memory. This is how it gets done. Any question, any question on this? Right, right. So, so the question really is, when we load this data, how does it know about the point in time recovery, right? Remember the point in time recovery happens, you uh, load to a database backup, Right? You load the database backup, then you apply the log. So what I'm talking here is when I'm loading the files in the beginning. Right? Once you apply the log, it will happen. Right? So the key point to take away from this one is the recovery that we are doing or the loading the data is being done in parallel. And in our experiments, what we found is that we are able to load the data with the speed of I.O. And while the data is being loaded, indexes are being loaded as well. So this is happening at that speed. Yeah? Right. 
So the question is uh, that you want to restore your Hackathon database as another database, but without Hackathon tables, right? That is not possible because the restore is a physical operation, right? So, so you need to, I mean, the restore is not going to change nothing, right? It's going to lay the files the way that you have backed up. Right. So the question is, if I moved my table to Hackathon, can I go back to my SQL? So the table exists in a Hackathon. What you can do is you can say select star from Hackathon table, insert into the SQL table, and drop my Hackathon table. Right? That's how you can convert. You cannot do alter table, make it disk space at this time. Okay? So this is how it is done. I'll go to my last slide and then... Uh, so this, I wanted to show you about the recovery process that happens in SQL Server today, okay? So what I show here is you have a database running. There are a bunch of pages sitting in the buffer pool here. And the, let, the black dot that you see are the pages that are dirty in the buffer pool. So now if you want to shut down, the clean shutdown. So what happens in the clean shutdown, it, it writes those pages back to the disk. Once they are done, then SQL process goes away, right? And when you restart, there is nothing to apply to the log, and you start like that, right? There's nothing to be loaded to the buffer pool because there was no logs to be applied. Now let's see how that works with Hackathon. In Hackathon, this is a same node, but here I have a Hackathon table. Notice, Hackathon table is fully in Hackathon uh, memory, right? And there are some dirty pages from SQL table. So when I do shutdown, those pages get flushed to the disk, and the data is whatever offline thread is writing to the data file, it is writing here. And now I shut down, right? When I start, at that time, the database is not online yet, because I have not loaded the in-memory data for Hackathon. I need to load that data. You see that unlike SQL Server, I did not have to load any table in memory because it was a clean shutdown. But for Hackathon, I have to load data in memory. Once I have loaded the data in memory, now my database is online. You see the difference on this one? Now the question really is, how soon can I do it? As we talked about, the data is loaded in parallel. So it is at the speed of uh, the disk I.O. So you have to account for, there'll be some impact on, on, uh, on the RTO. Now one thing that I want to talk about, because people had questions about always on, when we have always on integration, you have primary replica and secondary replica. The secondary replica has in-memory data in memory as logs are getting applied. So think of this right, Hackathon table will be in memory both for primary database as well as for secondary database. If I fail over, I do not have to load data from disk into memory because it is already there. So there's no impact on the RTO from always on perspective. Okay. So pretty much that's all I had. Uh, let me just take to my summary slide. Let me summarize everything for you guys. So key uh, takeaway from my perspective for you guys is it is not page-based, it is in-memory tables. We manage memory well. We expose all bells and whistles of how memory is being used, and there's a garbage collection that is cooperative. We provide hackathon persistence, and storage is a little different. It is not sequential. It is, uh, it is sequential. It is not random I.O., and you see why it is happening. And we manage the storage efficiency by merging files as we need it. And the logging, recovery, backup, restore, everything works just like before. So this is a fully integrated engine from storage perspective. Thanks for staying with me, and um, have a great afternoon. Yeah. And I'll be here for questions. Yeah. Sorry? So merge in general is writing to a file that is not being used by anybody. It is reading from source files and writing to a new file. The transactions are just writing to the log records, right? So there is no impact. I will be in the booth after this, yeah. Yes, I will be at the booth for next two, three hours. If you want to stop by, I'll be happy to take the questions, but I'm here as well. Yeah.